Hello and welcome to this latest episode of the Driving at Profit with Zero Emissions podcast. I'm Barbara Albert, the co-CEO of 100% Renewables, a consultancy specialized in the development of net zero strategies. Today we're speaking with Global Fashion Group. Global Fashion Group, or GFG for short, serves customers in 17 countries and connects 1 billion potential customers with thousands of global, local and owned brands via its e-commerce platforms. Each platform is operated under an individual brand name, Dafiti in Brazil, Argentina, Chile and Colombia, La Moda in Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Ukraine, Zalora in Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei, and the iconic in Australia and New Zealand. GFG announced its carbon mitigation strategy in their 2020 climate report. In that strategy, GFG prioritizes the three biggest levers for carbon reduction. Its products, being the raw material and manufacturing processes of their products, making up 68% of their footprint. Its logistics, which is both inbound and outbound logistics, including returns, making up 12% of their footprint. And its operations, being the energy usage in their facilities, making up 1% of the carbon footprint. Collectively, these three categories contributed more than 80% of GFG's total emissions in 2020 and therefore provide significant opportunity for reduction. In addition to the reduction activities focused on these three areas, GFG has committed to developing science-based targets. Carbon modeling work is now underway to support their target setting process and understand the impact of key actions and targets to drive emissions reduction in the long term. Joining me today is Jana Quintance James. Jana is the Chief Sustainability Officer at GFG. Jana holds accountability for the development and implementation of the group's sustainability vision to be people and planet positive worldwide. Leading teams in Australia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Russia and the CIS, she drives development and delivery of the group strategy in relation to ethical trade, environment, community and responsible workplace, and works closely with internal and external stakeholders to deliver the change agenda for sustainability globally. Hi, Jana, and welcome to the Driving at Profit with Zero Emissions show. Hi, Barbara. Thank you so much for having me. Fashion to me is a form of self-expression. Every day I get up and I choose the clothes I'll wear for the day. And the clothes reflect how I see myself, the mood I'm in on the day, and the image I want to portray to the outside world. Everyone needs clothing, but as a society, most of us are buying many more clothes than we need. And we contribute to the throwaway culture, just like we do with so many other things. Environmental concerns about the fashion industry have long been recorded in terms of its impact on water and chemical use, the carbon impact of the material production process through to product being flown around the world and ending up in landfill or being incinerated. Now McKinsey research shows that the fashion industry sector was responsible for about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions in 2018. So today I'm excited to talk to you about GFG's strategy and how carbon emissions can be tackled in the fashion industry. Jana, what can you tell us about Global Fashion Group? Thanks, Barbara. Um, Global Fashion Group is a pure play e-commerce fashion and lifestyle retailer. So we operate predominantly in emerging markets, but are actually listed in, in Frankfurt. So we specialize in low internet penetration markets with high growth potential. And most of our business involves trading third party brands um, through either a wholesale or a marketplace model. Um, but we also have a portfolio of our own brands where we're responsible for the design and the development of the product ourselves. Um, so we're a global business, but we have uh, local operations in our markets with very diverse cultures and lifestyles. So this diversity is really at the heart of everything we do. And I guess it gives us real meaning to our purpose, which is true self-expression. And I totally agree with your 
um, you know, intent around, you know, the way that you put something on in the morning and the way that it makes you feel. And um, at GFG, we want to make our customers, um, you know, feel that every day, feel that, um, that feeling of empowerment um, to express their true vision of themselves. And for our listeners here in Australia, can you bring the iconic to life as an, exa as an example? Uh, what do your operations in Australia look like? Yeah, so everybody uh, hopefully in Australia knows the iconic. It's been operating since uh, uh, 2011 and it's just turning 10 actually. Um, and is now Australia and New Zealand's leading fashion, sports and lifestyle retailer online and uh, serves customers in Australia and New Zealand from three hubs in Sydney, um, one of which is the Fulfillment Centre. Um, so there's a thousand team members uh, almost on the ground in, uh, for the iconic in Australia. Uh, and it's really known for its industry uh, leading delivery services, um, very wide assortment, and some groundbreaking sustainability initiatives, such as the Sustainable Shopping Edit Considered, which was delivered in 2019. And more recently, its partnership with Aerobe, uh, which is a world first uh, one click opportunity for customers to enable their products to enter the circular economy um, and extend the life cycle of their fashion items um, once they're finished with them. That sounds great. I hope you can tell us more about this initiative um, a bit later on. But let's talk about your carbon footprint, specifically the carbon footprint of fashion. Now, if you're wearing something made from cotton, there'll be emissions associated with growing that cotton, such as large amounts of fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, and then, of course, the water consumption. If you're wearing synthetic fibers, then oil has to be extracted and refined. And in both cases, uh, with the cotton or with the synthetic fibers, they all have to go to textile factories uh, where fibers are spun and fabrics are made. And then these fabrics go to clothes factories where the fabrics are turned into garments. Probably all of these factories would have some sort of fossil fuel uh, input into the production. And then once the clothes are produced, they have to be shipped to the place where we purchase them. And once we've worn them, they get either discarded, end up in landfill, or they get recycled and perhaps shipped again. What does the global carbon footprint of a company like GFG look like? Uh, so like uh, any fashion business, Barbara, the, the climate impact uh, of our businesses is primarily in scope three. Um, and that means that our products specifically account for the mass, vast majority. So what you talked about in terms of the um, processing of the materials and, and production of the final item. So actually 68% of GFG's footprint comes um, from uh, that stage. Um, our logistics is the next biggest category and, and people often immediately associate an online retailer with that logistical footprint. It's actually relative to the products pretty small. Um, it's 12% of the total. Um, so roughly 6% um, of suppliers sending products to us and another 6% from uh, us to, um, to customers. So for the last mile um, in 2020. Um, and then actually relative to that, our direct operational footprint is pretty small um, because we don't have any stores and we have mainly warehouses um, that store product and, and don't require a lot of machinery or and therefore energy um, demands. Um, we don't own, own data centers, for example. So um, actually our direct operational footprint is about 1% um, of the total. That's so interesting to hear that. So 68% of your total footprint is actually in the raw materials and the manufacturing processes of your products. Um, can you tell us more about those emissions? Because uh, how can our listeners visualize where these emissions are coming from in terms of, of growing and manufacturing the materials that form your products? Yeah, so I think, I mean, apparel accounts for the largest proportion of our footprint. Um, given what a significant proportion of our range it is. And so that is around the raw materials. So you think about farming, spinning, dyeing, tanning, that type of thing, um, as well as then the, the product manufacturing and, and um, you know, for example, energy usage in factories to power machinery, et cetera. Um, footwear actually by comparison accounts for a disproportionate chunk um, relative to its place in our assortment um, because Footwear is 
and is quite widely known to be highly carbon intensive. And I guess that goes to a number of different factors. If you think about a single shoe, um, you know, there's a lot of materials in there. So there's many different components that make up a shoe um, and they each have their own supply chain, if you can think about it like that. Also, secondly, in footwear, the nature of the materials used, I mean, the reality is there's a lot of um, a, a plastics uh, used in footwear um, and they in turn, um, as you touched on um, earlier, the, uh, you know, come from a fossil fuel themselves. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, finally, the energy intensity of the manufacturing process. Um, and often this is taking place in countries, um, you know, that maybe don't have, have it transitioned away from coal-fired power stations or, or similar. Um, so really it's in footwear, it's a kind of a triple whammy um, and it does account for quite a significant proportion of the overall footprint. So it sounds like a very uh, complex uh, problem to look at. In terms of your uh, global operations, is there much of a difference between the global carbon footprint and the local carbon footprint here in Australia? Look, it's it's pretty similar. Um, it mostly, the differences are mostly to the different operational models. So for example, in Russia, uh, we actually own some of our fleet there. Um, and so therefore that's accounted uh, for in our direct footprint rather than in scope three, although we also um, have scope three logistics emissions outbound in, in Russia, so it's a bit of a dual model. And, um, you know, that really is uh, driven by what's appropriate in that market. And, and that's sort of what makes GFG successful is, is really tailoring our solutions and, and customer offering on that basis. Um, by way of comparison, in Latin America, actually, it began really um, much more as a shoe business. So there's a higher proportion of footwear in the assortment compared to the other regions. And given, as we discussed, um, footwear um, you know, has a, a bigger impact, um, it really does dominate the local footprint in a way that it doesn't do so in other regions. Mm. Sounds like there's been a lot of work uh, going into the development of the carbon footprint. I'd like to ask a question on your climate leadership and targets. So we've heard that it's a really complex problem, multifaceted and emissions are coming mostly from scope threes. Um, I was wondering whether reports such as the recently released um, IPCC report or the upcoming COP26 affect your strategy much. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it doesn't affect our strategy in the sense that, you know, we've we've always had clear, well, not always, but we, we have clear plans. Um, but I think it affects us internally as humans and, and drives us to act, you know, as parents and, and concerned individuals. And, um, you know, when uh, we read the IPCC report, it's you know, not just, you know, my teams directly within the business, but more broadly, actually the greatest lever that we, many of us have is to influence change through this organization. So the fact that we have that as an opportunity is um, sort of empowering. Um, uh, and I think it's been helpful as well, the sort of broader narrative around uh, climate change uh, and, you know, beginning with IPCC, um, the run up to COP26, the Australian, uh, uh, net zero commitment, um, et cetera. And because at the same time, we've been working on our science-based targets blueprint. So it really, it makes you feel as a part of, you know, it's sort of an added emphasis and, and drive um, a, and, and energy towards our ambitions in this area. And, and what does showing up for climate action mean for your business? Well, I think in, in practice, it's, it's going to mean the transformation of our business in the next five to 10 years. And I guess, really leading from the front in terms of sustainability. We talked a little bit at the beginning in the intro around our footprint. It's, you know, it's Russia, it's Chile, it's Argentina, it's um, Indonesia. Um, there's not necessarily an, a detailed or in-depth understanding from all, um, you know, in all of our markets around what sustainability means. And so, you know, we really need to play a role in driving consumer awareness of and engagement in more sustainable products, um, as well as, concurrently leading and influencing the brands in our markets to change their supply chains and their materials because the reality is we're not designing and developing and, and making those supply chain decisions about most of the products that we sell um, so we really need to use our platforms as a mechanism and um, a, a driver of change in our markets.
that's great. It's not only influencing the strategy of your own business, but your suppliers as well. So what does that look like at a global GFG level? Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, as a business, um, we have a bit of an internal dichotomy around, you know, we're a listed business in Europe, uh, but it, as I said, we're practically operating in emerging markets. And so there's a bit of um, sometimes tension between those two things and need to bring those uh, together and help each side sort of understand the, the practical reality. Um, but I think in practice, that means that translating those expectations of stakeholders at the global level and building internal engagement around that and um you know i need to drive that agenda and the ambition as a group to ensure we're making the progress that we you know we really need to see at the global level well how does it influence leadership positions and actions well i think leadership is absolutely a crucial aspect um of, of driving anything in respect of of sustainability and it's essential that it comes from the very top which fortunately for GFG is absolutely assured in our support of our, um, a, both uh, we have a co-CEO model and, and both our CEOs are absolutely emphatic about the priority that sustainability um, needs to be given in, in, in terms of um, you know, driving forward our business and, and differentiating our business. Um, but it's also essential that we empower and support the next layer of executive leadership to really buy into that and, and own the agenda. Um, you know, I or nor the CEO can be everywhere. And to, so to be successful, we must really embed that ownership amongst senior leaders alongside uh, the, the other commercial or other priorities and ensure that that climate agenda or sustainability agenda is, is not conflicting or deprioritized, but is really working, you know, concurrently um, with the other ambitions and, and priorities that they have. Yeah, and making sure that it's part of the agenda. So how do global objectives filter down through the organization? You mentioned previously the headquarters in, in Europe and then your operations being worldwide. So how do these global objectives filter down through every level and every region throughout the organization? Mm. I mean, I think strategy is essential here and, um, you know, working, ultimately working collaboratively with everybody across the organization to produce that strategy is, you know, where we want to be historically, um, you know, to drive the change we needed in a more short space of time, it's probably, it's been a bit more top down than I would have liked. Um, but as over the past couple of years, we've built more engagement and I guess increased capability within our own business, um, you know, right down to those regional levels, we've been able to support a more effective bottom-up build. So we're actually working on a new strategy right now and um, which takes us through to 2030. I mean, it's a much more top-down bottom-up approach where we've basically communicated the overall strategic priorities for the business. And then our uh, regions on the ground are assessing what makes sense for their markets, determining their ambition level in relation to the targets and then what practically can be achieved. So actually forecasting and modeling what you know they predict around for example, what they know they and can predict around availability of electric vehicles um, in Latin America, for example, and, and how that, um, uh, you know, what that means in practice for, for driving that agenda. Um, so when we finish this process, which is almost uh, done, we've, um, the product will be essentially at the group level, a suite of targets that are informed by their regional interfaces. So it's really created that well, will is creating that real ownership at that regional level, and then the, the group is essentially a product of, of the operations. Um, and then, I guess, on the on, as we do now quarterly, the regions will report up to the board um, on their performance uh, uh, and uh, on a quarterly basis, and um, uh, in turn also to the regional sustainability committees as well. And uh, you mentioned previously, I heard you say science-based targets. So what are your climate change targets? Um, for example, I understand that your operations already run on 100% renewable energy, which is very exciting. Uh, it's a fairly small part of your carbon footprint. So what about your overall business climate change uh, goal or goals? Yeah, so we've, we've made the commitment to science-based targets and are on the verge of being able to submit them to the um, SBTI initiative uh, for approval. Um, and so these will result in very significant reductions uh, for 2030, but because I haven't submitted them yet, I can't be specific about them. But essentially what we've done and um, been working on the past six months, working on for the past six months, 
is a whole portfolio of carbon mitigation targets, sort of more at the initiative level, which together um, we have basically blueprinted their carbon return to roll that up and, and give us a, a framework for delivering on the SBT. So when we make that commitment, we actually know exactly what we need to do to get there. Um, and we'll be announcing the specifics in early 2021, but essentially, you know, there's a huge focus on the products again, so sustainable materials, eco-friendly production processes, um, logistics, so um, transition to electric vehicles, um, and, and also on our operations, um, which whilst a small part of our footprint, you know, we think it's really important to, to lead from the front, basically, to demonstrate how it's done. Mm. It's no small feat to commit to uh, a science-based target because there is um, all the decarbonisation efforts have to focus on your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And you can't just um, purchase carbon offsets to achieve that emission reduction. It all has to yeah. be pretty much your own carbon footprint and you have to deal with it. So that's a, a big uh, announcement to uh, have science-based targets, which, which is great. I feel happy as well to have um, a blueprint, you know, in, in my position to actually, rather than just be sort of putting it out there and hoping for the best, but actually we know the very specific initiatives that need to be uh, delivered in order to deliver on those SPTs yes. as well. And how they all feed into meeting the targets, and because so much of your scope, th um, so much of your carbon footprint is in the scope threes, you'll have to have a, a science-based target on your scope threes, and yeah, it's a big undertaking, of course. Um, so I want to focus for a little bit uh, on some of the external factors that may influence your strategies, uh, such as, for instance, peer pressure, as in what are your competitors up to. Uh, we touched on the science, like we discussed science-based targets and how uh, you've signed up to them. What about the task force on climate-related financial disclosures um, and the sustainable development goals, for example? So first up, what's happening in your sector? What are the trends and how does it influence your strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's a good question, particularly because we are working on our, uh, our brand new strategy. So we have done a lot of uh, research this year on, on what's happening in our markets uh, uh, and at the global level in respect of sustainability um, and you know, looking at through the stakeholder lens as well and investors and uh, customers, et cetera. Um, I mean, customers and investors are probably the two key call-outs in terms of stakeholders, and they're increasingly vocal about their expectations of a you know listed business in Europe in respect of sustainability. And, and it's no longer, um, I think I've noticed particularly from the investor side, uh, you know, it's no longer the kind of add-on, but it is really a fundamental part of decision making um, of of investors, and therefore you know, our need to um, engage with and actively manage, for example, the investor ESG rating systems, um, of which there are a plethora out there, um, has definitely increased. Um, uh, customers, I when, think... When did you notice that shift? Well, we've really noticed, I mean, we listed two years ago, so um, the... Uh, I guess there's potential that it was a natural increase in that respect, but I've really noticed it, especially in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. in particular and um, which is actually somewhat surprising because I mean I've been working in this industry for 20 years and, and frankly 10 years ago you know in a global crisis like the pandemic sustainability would have you know been deprioritized but actually it seems to have had the an alternative effect there and it's actually really um, I think highlighted the potential of uh, climate change to have a cataclysmic effect on business and um, you know it's kind of like a almost like a test scenario um, and so it's actually from an investor perspective particularly is accelerated engagement not uh, not decreased it which is great. Peer and competitors I mean it's a complex sort of picture for us given we operate across so many markets and it's really different by whichever market you look in you know, um, if you're looking at global peers and competitors there's so much going on and that's amazing that there's such momentum in this space um, and, you know, such incredible leadership um, from, you know, the likes of Zalando and Farfetch and uh, ASOS and similar. Um, and then if you look in our markets, uh, it's, you know, can be quite a complex picture. Um, and, you know, uh, in Russia, you know, there's not necessarily a great deal of activity. Um, you know, similarly in Brazil, there's a, there's a bit more, but um, and there's you know some leaders, but then quite a lot of the market. There's a few leaders, and there's quite a lot of the market that's not doing anything. So, 
we need to um you know be mindful of of that but it does we I guess we see the opportunity in many of our markets to to take a leadership position we've got lots more work to do to do that but um, that's certainly an option there um and then in terms of the trends the one thing I would also call out is around the greenwashing uh, and the uh, I guess on one hand you know we have this great demand from stakeholders and particularly customers around more information on product around sustainability and um, you know and uh, you know and enabling them to uh, you know shop more sustainably for example but at the same time and it, it's sort of suspicion and, and fear around the type of information um, and a mistrust of organizations and providing that information so there's a bit of a challenge I think to manage in that respect it's you know we want to be able to put that information out there but you know the rigor that and the investment and um and that needs to be put behind that in order to do it, which is, you know, obviously worthwhile, but these systems and processes are not necessarily built to scale at the moment. And uh, so um, there's a real challenge there as well. So I want to come back to your operations and value chain emissions and um, being a global company, uh, what are the, uh, the challenges in measuring and managing the global carbon footprint and um, the embodied emissions in the clothes, the footwear, the accessories you sell. How did you go about measuring your carbon footprint to make sure that it's that it's accurate and it's across a lot of different countries? So what challenges did you encounter when measuring that uh, in terms of the data gathering, the accuracy of different systems? Yeah, I mean, so many. Um, the, so we we have a footprint in 19 countries. We serve customers in 17, but we have um, you know, some kind of footprint in 19. Um, and so it requires a lot of different people uh, to be coordinated across our group um, and uh, in terms of that data collection. Um, and we need a lot of information from external partners as well. And so it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a manual task. It's, it's unfortunately today it's very manual much more so than I would like. Um, and ultimately, you know, next year, a big focus would be us to be trying to automate that data collection because we also, at the moment, are in a situation where we can only do the carbon footprint annually, which is actually, for science-based targets, I need to know on a more regular basis, essentially, how we're going and how and everybody wants to know on a, on a more, um, you know, on essentially more frequently um, uh, in order to, to know how we're tracking. Because if we only um, have it every year, then, you know, we're laggards in terms of making those changes. I guess you want to see when you get those electric vehicles in your fleet and when you change over to 100% renewables, how that affects your carbon footprint uh, immediately rather than, than waiting for uh, like the, the like after a year has passed and even longer because you need to gather all the data. So you will always have it retrospectively and not immediately. Yeah, absolutely. And we also have, um, you know, to your point around sort of data accuracy, I think, uh, you know, as you may be aware, um, or your listeners may be aware, you can use different types of data depending on the granularity that you have available. Um, and in some cases, we've had to use spend data um, because we don't have more granular information um, uh, available to us and um you know so that i guess you know it's not a hundred percent ideal situation so we're constantly improving uh, robustness i guess is the word i'm looking for um and we've already made it quite a marked improvement in that between our 2019 and 2020 footprints and then we'll see that again um and when we start to do the 21 footprint in a couple of months time yeah and in my opinion that's that's so important it's it's much more important to start somewhere and even if the data is not quite accurate at least uh, you're trying to get a handle of it you're estimating the data at least it forms part of your carbon footprint even if it's refined at a later stage but it's just so important to get it all in the boundary to look at it to see um the magnitude of it so i think that's uh, that's a very robust process you're going through because you're looking at them you're including them and then you're finding as you go so in your sustainability report, you mentioned that you ran workshops with senior leaders from across GFG to collaboratively identify the focus areas of your carbon mitigation strategy. Can you tell us more about this process? How did you go about um, engaging your leaders? How did you run these workshops? How did you get them to be engaged in the process? Yeah, so essentially this was the precursor to starting the science-based targets uh, blueprint that I mentioned before. Um, 
and I guess we always start from a place of engagement because we need to bring everybody along on the journey. It's an overused word in sustainability, but it's overused for a reason. Um, and, you know, we needed those senior leaders not only to be the ones to decide what they um, want, you know, what they thought that we should do so that they would own it when we were doing it, um, but also so that they had uh, ensure that they had enough background to understand the why. Um, and I guess there's, you know, perhaps it's our markets or perhaps it's, um, you know, common um, across many organisations, I suspect it may be, is that, the, you know, the climate literacy is, was relatively low. And so, you know, through the workshop process, we really built knowledge and, um, you know, spent time building um, capability and knowledge of the teams around climate change and what the potential impact to the business would be. Um, and then, you know, once we had done that, essentially leverage them to help them prioritise the initiatives in an informed way. So then, um, you know, what we talked around before is the products, logistics and operations. That was what was identified out of that workshop process. And that will be the scope of our science-based targets as well. Um, so it all kind of links through um, and but it's all about bringing everybody on along on the um, climate mitigation journey, carbon mitigation journey. I, I can imagine uh, um, how, how this process has unfolded um, because on, on a basic level, everyone knows what climate change means and how it affects us as a society. But as soon as you have to dig deeper and you open the hood and you look inside and you have science-based targets and then suddenly you've got scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, um, and it gets really technical. And then there's so much um, um, need for explaining all the technical intricacies to bring everyone along on the journey. So it's, it's a big um, education effort, of course. This episode is brought to you by 100% Renewables. And Barbara just mentioned the need to bring senior executives on board with a net zero strategy and talked about some of the language and the terms associated with climate action, like scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, and science-based targets. The language and the acronyms can be confusing, so to help make this easier, we've created a carbon jargon page on our website. We explain lots of the terms and provide graphics and explanations that you can use in your presentations to increase climate literacy. You can find a link to this carbon jargon page in the show notes, which includes a downloadable PDF. Now, it's a live page which we update regularly, so if you don't find the terms that you're looking for, check back again later or let us know so we can add it. So in terms of your biggest emissions, uh, what emission reduction opportunities, and that's looking to your SBT targets and how you're going to meet them, what emission reduction opportunities have you uncovered across your value chain? Because it's really exciting to hear about that. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, the biggest return will be uh, transforming the materials um, in, in both our own brands and in influencing third-party brands and, and um, to have their assortment made from more sustainable materials and through lower impact production processes. So that might mean um, you know, on the material side, transforming to uh, a lower carbon alternative material around um, organic cotton or, or um, you know, recycled nylon or, or whatever that might be. Um, uh, and then on the lower production processes, um, for example, looking at um, renewable energy usage in, uh, in factories, uh, for example, um, or looking at uh, you know, increasing the assortment that has its final stage made in Australia, um, as an example, as well. I think also, though, it comes back, you know, we really need to think about supply, which is those aspects, transform the materials, create that product, provide that to our customers. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're influencing the demand um, as well, and that we can currently try and influence um, consumer decision making and, and, and drive them towards that lower impact product um, and, and essentially show that you know, um, that more sustainable product, you don't have to be dressed in a Hessian sack. You can, you know, there's a wide range of beautiful products that's available to you and you can be more sustainable. Um, and so the way that we're doing that is having launched sustainable, what we call sustainable shopping edits in all our regions. Um, and so that means that customers can essentially within our platforms filter um, a, within a certain um you know, essentially by what's important to them. So, uh, and access products that's better for humans, animals, or the environment. 
And then all products are basically verified by our in-house specialist who's ensuring they meet one of um, you know, the specific criteria. So again, for example, thinking about organic cotton example, um, then customers can actually go into the sustainable materials category and, and, and browse the range of, of products um, made from those alternative materials. So it's interesting to hear that it's it's both a, a supply and a, and a demand question. So from a supply perspective, that manufacturers um, and distributors are offering sustainable, low carbon products, but also for the customer, of course, to choose these products and to um, bust common misconceptions as to the looks and the aesthetics and uh, and making sure that that customers can also select specifically uh, environmentally friendly products, uh, low carbon products. So it's 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 great that you are offering this choice on your platform. So how have you noticed any shifts in customer demand for sustainable or low carbon products? Has there been uh, has there always been much interest, or is it a, an education effort that has to happen first? Have have there, have there been any trends that you've been able to observe? Well, I think. Um... I mean, I guess something that GFG prides itself on is offering customers, um, you know, functionalities and, and um, initiatives before they necessarily know that they need them. Um, I, but I, I think what's most exciting for me is that, you know, to thinking about the iconic considered, um, the, um, which is the Australian version of our sustainable shopping edit, it was actually, it's actually the oldest one. It's launched in April 2019, um, and it. Uh, you know, it's really become mainstream. It's integrated within the site. Um, you can you don't have to go in and you know be a sustainability geek to go in and shop that range. It's just it's embedded throughout um, uh, the uh, the assortment. Um, and uh, you know, since the beginning of January, uh, forty percent of customers on the iconic have um, uh, shopped a considered item. So it's not really, I think, and I that excites me because it's not about um, you know, maybe you or me that needs to be influenced. It's, you know, kind of um, the normal non-sustainability people um, who, you know, need to see and, and, and adopt and, and embrace this type of product as well. So that's what really um, fills me with joy, I guess. We've also seen a, a great level increase in great engagement from brands themselves. So when um, the edit launched in 2019, there was 315 brands who had some or all of their range included within considered and today that is over 700 so we've seen a huge shift in terms of um you know uh, brand engagement in this topic but i think that's also because they can see the demand from customers and we can share the data around how customers are interested and engaged with this product so it does really help um you know the, the two sides of the supply and demand coin yeah, that's a huge difference when looking at just what you said, the statistics uh, with your suppliers shifting to more sustainable products. That's uh, actually so good to hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something else that I found interesting was when I did research for our interview today and I looked at your climate report, I saw this fabulous electric vehicle that's being used in your defeative distribution areas. I wanted to talk more about that. So 12% roughly of your carbon footprint comes from, from logistics. So that's emissions associated with suppliers and, and brands sending you products that you ship to customers and then emissions of course generated from the parcels you send to your customers which includes your, your own brands and other brands. So what initiatives have you implemented or are you looking to implement to reduce reduce these emissions from your logistics? Yeah so I mean the logistics pieces of fairly complicated one and it, it certainly does vary by market so it is um you know depending on which country of ours you're, you're talking about it's i mean the example you saw for defiti was in chile uh, and we've now um so we're using some electric vehicles for the last mile there we've also been able to extend that into colombia as well we would love to um extend that further but we have quite um a, at the moment it's very difficult the supply of electric vehicles um, in, into Latin America is um, very limited. Um, and so we're not able actually to, to scale in the way that we'd like to there. And um, we're also using some electric vehicles for last mile uh, here in Sydney. 
um, in other markets, uh, for example, Brazil, uh, and um, uh, we have extended to bikes for the last mile. Um, and also in Russia, we have uh, walking uh, options uh, for the last mile as well. So we have a network of pickup points in Russia um, and uh, customers can elect um, to have that uh, delivered um, to their house uh, by foot. Um, the, Great from a health perspective. I can see how yeah. a lot of people would sign up for that and wanting to work for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, obviously, they need to dress up very warm in Moscow in the winter. <laughs> um, the, uh, in terms of the, um, the inbound emissions, so that's when a customer, sorry, a supplier is um, sending products to us. Um, uh, I mean, this is a very complex um, uh, piece. Um, the, the key mechanism, or the uh, I guess the most most obvious one, is to shift um, from where there's air freight being used into sea freight. Um, and in some respects, COVID has helped that because it's actually demonstrated that it's possible um, and that we can still meet um, the, you know, have a great product available, um, great sort of new product available to customers and, and meet customer demand, even though we're delivering by sea. Um, so that's been uh, wonderful. And um, I, I guess there is, um, it, it is that middle mile that really creates um, quite a lot of complexity. And so um, we will need to be um, continue to focus on that. And some of our markets are super complex in that respect. So, uh, you know, there's sometimes just no other options, for example, to deliver a, a a, you know, a, a village in Indonesia, for example. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work to do in respect of, of this particular uh, area. So you mentioned before the difference between air freight and sea freight. So just so that our listeners understand that a bit better, there's a huge difference, isn't there, between shipping a product via uh, an aeroplane or via a ship. So um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm not going to remember the exact uh, quantum uh, off the top of my head, but um, the the air freight is, um, you know, is very inefficient from a, from a carbon uh, perspective. Um, the obviously, I guess the challenge in supply chain is that there's not always entirely our decision um, about whether um, certain things are, you know, delivered in, in a certain mechanism. So often it's brands making that decision on our behalf. So we need to influence the brand, which might have an impact on the way that things are packed in the factory, for example, and, you know, orders need to be divided, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a very complex picture, that particular one. Mm. So going back to a very tiny fraction of your carbon footprint being waste, um, it's, it is a tiny proportion of your carbon footprint, but from a customer's perspective, it's something tangible that we see when the parcel arrives. The parcel arrives in the post, you, you unpack it, you take out the garment, uh, the footwear, you throw the packaging in the bin, and then you wonder how the packaging can be reduced uh, or made to be more environmentally friendly. And then uh, not, not just the packaging, of course, but then the, the garment, the footwear, the accessory itself. Once we've worn them, there is the problem of post-consumer waste. So after we discard our clothes, our shoes and our accessories, is it possible to reduce emissions from waste when it comes to the packaging and to post-consumer waste? What is GFG doing in this regard? Yeah, so I mean, as you mentioned, it's a relative, it's a tiny part of the footprint overall. So it's not, it's not one of the core focuses of our carbon uh, mitigation strategies. Um, I guess we focus on packaging and on waste for other reasons, and um, though, so it's still very much a, an important part of our sustainability strategy. Um, I think, firstly, it, we have to acknowledge the role that packaging plays in terms of the protection protection of the product, um, and. Uh, you know, if we end up sending a, a, you know, if the product gets damaged on the way to the customer, um, then we end up with a different waste issue, I mean, and a more significant uh, one as well, um, and additional carbon emissions associated with it being sent back and forth and, and that type of thing. So e-commerce, you know, is focused on packaging in order to protect the product. What we can do is make sure that we've transitioned that to be made from more sustainable materials. And in the Iconics case in Australia, they have transitioned the satchel, the outer satchel to be made from 100% recycled content. It was hard work to get it to 100%, um, but the teams have worked really hard to, to pursue that ambition to really make sure that we were, you know, really contributing to the, um, 
recycle plastic market, basically. You know, we need to create a market for um, uh, for all this plastic that exists in the world. And um, so it's 100% post-consumer um, recycle plastic. John, and what's, then, what's the challenge there to get it to 100%? Uh, well, essentially, um, the well, I, I would say two challenges on the hundred to get it to a hundred percent. Depending on the suppliers, um, you can sometimes it can smell, um, so it has a weird um, odor to it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, you can also um, the 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 sort of hand feel it gets like these sort of bumps, and depending on the color, you might remember the Iconics packaging was originally black. Um, and it has actually now trans changed to white. Um, and it was not possible essentially to get 100% recycled content in that black um, because it would, um, it was almost, it ended up like, a, we could refer to it as starry night because it was like this sort of um, small white dots on it. Um, and then the other challenge is around the pre consumer or the post consumer. So pre consumer is essentially off cuts from the factory floor, and post consumer is um, essentially it was a bottle in the drain or at my house that got recycled um and then it was melted down and respun into um you know into or sorry um not respun but um put back into plastic pallets um to ready to be made into packaging again so obviously the post-consumer option is better because um, it means that we actually are contributing to that market of, of creating a market for recycled goods um and, and a real incentive for things to be recycled rather than ending up in landfill that makes sense. And previously, you mentioned uh, going back to a couple of questions. You mentioned something like air rope. Yeah. So um, on the product side, um, the um, what we're trying to do is enable customers to give their products another life, um, and that means different things in different markets for GFG. But in Australia, recently, the iconic launched um, a partnership with air rope, which is essentially when you now purchase an item on the iconic with one click you can um, essentially unlock the potential to resell the item in the circular economy when you're finished with it. So it will basically pull through the data from the description, um, you know, that you can see when you're purchasing the product on the Iconic and also the photos, and it will pull those through to Airrobe. And so say later, I, you know, finished with this handbag or this jacket or whatever it might be, um, and I decide I want to sell it, um, I just have to, um, I unlock it in my Aerobe account and um, then I'll uh, be available for sale. It also provides a price uh, to the customer when they're purchasing the product on the Iconic. Um, they provided a price or potential resale price um, for later. So they actually get a feeling of how much they may be able to earn back in the, um, in the resale market later. So uh, touching on another tiny emission source, but one where you have 100% renewables, let's turn our attention to your warehouses and your offices. They only make up a small proportion, I think around 1%, but uh, you've done so much to address, address emissions in your operations. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I guess the first place to start was uh, electricity efficiency projects and and um, you know the key there you know, probably the one of the most important ones has been LED lighting and um, you know the return on investment was immediate um, which was very powerful in terms of making that investment and being able to see literally the next month the impact in, in terms of our electricity bill so we've been um, driving LED lighting across um, our uh, across all of our fulfillment centers we've also done things looked at you know um, I had an energy audit, for example, in the Sydney warehouse, where we could see that, you know, um, day by day, the common times of energy usage um, and, um, you know, understood around what we could be doing in terms of turning off lights at certain points of time and then installing um, sensor lights, et cetera, things like that. Um, we've also transitioned to green energy providers, um, again, in Australia. Um, uh, and then in certain markets uh, are working on the installation of uh, solar on the on the roof of our fulfillment center um for, th for three out of um, ten of our major fulfillment centers it's not as easy well it's not easy in Sydney it's not easy in um, Indonesia or um, Sao Paulo either um so and um, those are, are more longer term but um you know in those markets Indonesia or Brazil, for example, we, we don't have a green energy provider. There's no green energy providers existing in the market that we can just switch to easily. So um, the kind of having self-managed solar is, is really the, the best solution there. 
Um, we have, um, as a part of our offsetting portfolio last year, also purchased renewable energy certificates. So technically we are using uh, green energy across uh, the business. I guess um, I'm, <laughs> I'll be the first to tell you as I'm still keen to pursue the solar um, and so that make sure that we're you know, not a essentially double paying for our energy through certificates, um, but also um, that we're actually generating and contributing to, that, uh, to the uh, renewables market ourselves as well. So just to confirm, you're purchasing renewable energy certificates uh, for all your operations? Yeah, so for all of our fulfillment centres in 2020. Yeah. yeah, okay. So Jana, your business operates in many countries, and I know that you offset a proportion of your carbon footprint. What is GFG's opinion on offsetting in general, as opposed to more direct emission reduction opportunities, such as uh, installing solar panels, um, purchasing electric vehicles, engaging your suppliers to use sea freight as opposed to air freight, and other on-site opportunities? What is your opinion on offsetting as opposed to those more direct emission reduction opportunities? Well, look, I don't think it's about one or the other, to be honest. I think, you know, as we've, um, you know, hopefully I've already highlighted is that we're very committed to reducing our carbon intensity. And, and, and clearly that is, you know, what is essential when in any business who's, you know, not doing that or only relying on offsetting is, um, you know, is on the wrong path. Um, However, I think that there's a role for offsetting um, and certainly while that transition is underway, um, you know, it's really important to um, uh, support climate positive actions in the world, full stop, um, outside of our business. Um, but also internally, the offsetting uh, creates a really, um, I guess, an internal impetus for change um, in the sense that it essentially um, operates as, as a form of tax um, and uh, uh, so it really helps us to, I guess, um, focus in on, on the carbon, re carbon reduction activities um, so that, you know, hopefully in time, the, the cost of offsetting will be lower. So what are you currently offsetting? So at the moment uh, in 2020, we offset our operations and our outbound delivery footprint. So um, that was essentially um, the customer uh, deliveries for the last mile. Mm -hmm. So why only direct uh, operations and delivery? Uh, do you have any plans to offset your entire footprint to be able to claim carbon neutrality? Well, the um, it was our first time embarking on an offsetting portfolio. And so I think, again, it's all about the journey and, and maturing our internal business understanding of um, of, of climate uh, and, and carbon mitigation. So it's initially, it's been the scope one and two in deliveries. Um, and I guess those are the the bits that we really feel we have very direct control on. Um, and also we have quite strong confidence in the data that we have there. Um, scope three, the data, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a bit more um, uncertain and, and estimated. So we would certainly like to um, uh, extend the, the breadth to which of the, the coverage of the offsetting portfolio. But there'll be a number of different factors that we have to consider, you know, not least the cost of that um, as we go forth. As a business, it's important that the carbon offset strategy aligns with your business purpose and with your strategic priorities. What decision process did you go through internally to decide which carbon offset projects you would buy? And how did you arrive at the decision? Yeah, so it was, um, we sort of looked at a very rigorous process, we looked at a number of different providers. And then um, once we settled on the providers, a number of different pro projects. Um, once we got to the project um, uh, level, we looked at um, the alignment of the projects with the location of our operations. So obviously being able to, I guess, that offsetting portfolio resonating with our business in terms of um, where they were located. Um, the presence of certification um, and, you know, obviously wanting to make sure that we're working with verified uh, projects. Uh, the type of projects, so for example, renewables versus tree planting, for example, um, and then finally, the um, so not finally, but the um, presence of verified co-benefits. So, for example, employment benefits that might come from the projects as well. Um, and then, of course, um, finally, the budget available. So we essentially looked at these suite of um, factors um, and uh, determined, um, you know, uh, based on the options we had available to us, which one made the most sense for our organisation. 
So you mentioned uh, such the type of project, such such as, for instance, renewables versus tree planting. So which do you prefer? Well, I am um, in the 2020 portfolio, we went um, predominantly with renewables, um, I guess, in the end, the location of operations and the presence of certification, um, you know, are quite, both quite material factors, um, essentially limiting what's available. Um, and uh, so it ended up that it was renewables uh, for 2020. But I mean, overall, I would, I would prefer to move um, to those more climate positive activities over time. But you know, you're never just looking at one factor. So um, it's, you know, it's kind of um, trying to balance the suite of things that we need as an organization. So many organizations lately have been committing to a net zero target. Is GFG planning on establishing a pathway towards net zero emissions, um, exclusive of uh, carbon offsets, or like as an addition perhaps to your science-based target? Yeah, I mean, Potentially, um, I think, you know, we're first going to focus on the science based targets and I think, you know, there's clearly quite a lot of, well, it's clear to me that there's quite a lot of confusion in the market around net zero commitments and, and what this means and there's a lot of um, commitments being made um, and not necessarily a lot of blueprinting around how they're actually going to be delivered. And I don't mean, mean to say necessarily, you know, if we always knew exactly what we're, how we're going to get there, we would never do anything. But um, I think that what, as I've mentioned a number of times, is that I'm really trying to build the maturity of our organisation around climate um, and understanding carbon mitigation. And um, so that's been a journey in, in respect to the science-based targets and the carbon mitigation strategy and the new strategy that will launch, you know, broader sustainability strategy will launch the beginning of next year. Um, and so it's an iterative process. Um, I think once we get the momentum for the towards the science-based targets underway, then we can look at net zero in due course. But I think it would just be a bit premature for us as an organization, if I'm honest. Yeah. We're almost um, running out of time, but I wanted to quickly touch on climate risk. So extreme weather events such as floods and hurricanes or fires are becoming more frequent and more severe and may pose a risk to GFG's operations or that of your suppliers. And therefore it has an impact on your business continuity. Can you tell us a little bit more about the physical and transition risks that are most relevant to GFG and how have you gone about assessing these and how are they informing your business strategies going forward? Hmm. Good question. I mean, we're actually working on the refreshed uh, global risk assessment um, at the moment um, and having built on the increased awareness and capability around climate that we've been building, um, we saw that as a good opportunity to incorporate climate more formally into that risk assessment process. Um, I think that that is a journey uh, to understand, uh, you know, those risks and um, and improve our maturity and, you know, in our corresponding external reporting um, on those factors. The reality is we don't have a big physical footprint of our direct operations. So the reality, the impact is going to sit, you know, um, most likely be um, present within our supply chain. So it's really um, continuing to understand and, and mature the understanding of the supply chain risks um, that exist for GFG. Dan, it has been um, in, enlightening to hear how the fashion industry or where the carbon footprint of the fashion industry comes from and how the fashion industry and, and leaders such as yourself are tackling this issue. Now, for all our listeners that have heard about the complexity of the problem, all the intricacies, how everything feeds in together and how you can focus on emission reduction strategy, what can we do as consumers? So we all have to wear clothes, but we can also, every single one of us can make a difference with our shopping behavior. So what do you recommend consumers should do in terms of making more sustainable choices? I would recommend that your listeners are looking at the label um, and looking at the material that their product is made from um, and building their understanding of, of which of those uh, are, are more carbon intensive. Um, you know, I mentioned polyester earlier, um, moving away from those synthetic fibers, you know, choosing recycled or, or choosing organic cotton. Um, those are very powerful ways um, 
uh, to, to have an impact. I think we have a much better understanding of those choices that we can make in food, for example, um, but we can make those same type of choices in fashion as well. And, um, you know, and there's an amazingly um, wide choice available out there now, which is, you know, not like it was um, previously. And, and so we can really embrace that as consumers. And what advice would you give other businesses looking at the carbon mitigation journey? Probably exec leadership. Um, is incredibly important. Broad company engagement, so bringing everybody along on the journey and then investing in the data um, and, and really building your understanding of uh, you know, where your footprint lies um, and, and then taking the action uh, to influence that. Well, how can people connect with you? Uh, I'm happy for people to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. Um, you should find me there. And we'll put uh, your contact details in the show notes. That's all we have time for today, Jana. Thank you so much for being my guest on the podcast. Thank you, Barbara, so much for having me. That was Jana Quintance James, Chief Sustainability Officer at GFG, talking about how they are driving emissions reduction across their worldwide operations. If you know another person who you think will enjoy this podcast, please let them know so that more people can hear about best practice stories of how organizations are moving to net zero emissions. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode.